Jack Nicholas was born in Columbus, Ohio, and grew up playing at the Scioto Country Club, a fantastic facility with an incredibly difficult golf course, which probably put him in very, very good stead for what he was to achieve uh, later on. He was a superstar junior golfer. He won the US Amateur twice, and in 1960, as an amateur, finished second to Arnold Palmer. And it was an interesting changeover perhaps that year. That was the last year really of Ben Hogan and Hello World from Jack Nicholas. Well, Jack Nicholas went on to win pretty much everything, but what he did in the majors is truly exceptional. 154 consecutive majors he played in, 18 victories, 19 second places, nine thirds, 53. 53 top fives, that's a third of all of the tournaments, 73 top tens. So he absolutely dominated this particular time period for 36 years, an incredible run, amazing scenes. You know, that uh, Masters victory that he had over poor uh, Ballesteros, just a, an astonishing uh, spectacle. So for Nicholas, he focused on the majors more than anything else, and he dominated that scene. So for him, that was the excellence. His best was the best. In terms of his golf swing, he was a very powerful man, very, very strong uh, lower body. Very, very deliberate technique, you know, very much uh, not a Litrovino homemade swing, but very much given the instructions. He had a routine that he followed. He had a, a way of hitting that he worked on all the time. So very much a sort of a, a coached golfer. So in his golf technique, you know, had a real system that he went through, that same routine all the time with that chin working away, kept that club head outside of his hands, that right arm on top of his left arm, creating that famous flying right elbow and then from there used an incredibly powerful lower body leg drive to first of all clear him out of the way so he could hit that fade, get a little bit more of a down cock in his wrists so that he was able to drive through and he really created huge power, hit the ball much further than anybody else, hit the ball harder than anyone else and who can forget those amazing battles that he had, you know, sort of stood over the golf ball, those knees locked in, those elbows wide and he's almost like frozen in time there, and suddenly the motion starts and the ball rolls into the cup. So for Nicholas, a seriously fantastic champion and dominated at the very, very top of the game for a number of years. But interestingly enough, for sort of us who are interested in golf instruction, he wrote some really fantastic golf books. And he went through all the chipping and the pitching and strategy, you know, he was a massive strategist, uh, played golf almost like a chess match against the golf course. Really, really great instruction books. And he has remained so relevant in golf because he, he focused on the majors more than anything else and they became the pinnacles. Tiger Woods, the superstar golfer, focused to try to beat Nicholas's record. That's what his goal. And now it's going to be a contest to see if Tiger can actually beat Nicholas's record. But for Nicholas, I think, you know, his best was the best. And when he walked onto the driving range, he knew he was the best. And the big advantage was everyone else knew that he was the best. And that was just how he liked it. Tiger Woods came immediately into our screens, putting against Bob Hope on the Mike Douglas show in 1978, just three years old. So Tiger was the, the star that just exploded quickly and never stopped. So everything that you ever see about Tiger Woods, he was the first guy to do it, and it's a record set and record set red and broken. So we have to get used to that when we're looking at the Tiger Woods career. However, a stellar a junior career ended up with him going to uh, Stanford University as probably the most recruited young athlete uh, on the planet, and he would go on in his first year immediately to win that NCAA championship. As a freshman, he would go on to be the low amateur at the Masters and tie 22nd at the Open Championship. He had already had some exposure through his amateur game. He'd played quite a few uh, PGA Tour events, but never really made the cut. But nevertheless, I think he'd got used to what he was going to expect, and it was an amazing start. I mean, his last four tournaments in that first year as a professional were first, third, first, third. Anyway, now we go to 1997 and the Masters, and he shows the world how to play golf, and it started the Tiger Wood legend. And everything he did, he just dominated. You know, from a golf coaching's point of view, it was very interesting, sort of three very distinct chapters. When he was quite a young guy, very slim, 
very, very fast, hadn't really put any muscles on his body yet, and he was going under the uh, guidance of Butch Harmon. So Butch Harmon is dealing with a golf swing, one that was incredibly fast and explosive, perhaps, you know, be the best athlete to actually ever be playing golf. So what Butch's job was to try to tone that down. If we look at Tiger's uh, initial swings, not to be critical, but to say, if anything, there was a tendency for the club to get a little bit across the line, so a bit pointing to the right um, of the target at the top of the backswing, perhaps a little bit shut, maybe losing a bit of angles, losing a bit of sequences, and no doubt he definitely had sort of a push and a, and a bit of a hook um, in his game. So the Butch Harmon sort of solution to this was a shorter, tighter backswing. So we used to see Tiger Woods practicing all the time, trying to keep that right elbow down to the ground and in front of him during that time period and uh, just some sensational scoring performances during the Butch Harmon era. So he completely dominated and if we look at his, his body, he went from sort of a boy's body to really a man's body. He got stronger, he got faster, he got more stable and if you combine the great things that Butch did, one, keeping that steel shafted short driver in his hand so that Tiger was playing golf out of the fairway. You combine that with the wedge skills that Butch taught him with the best putting stroke, or at least the ability to hold the most putts under pressure. It was an unbeatable force. However, end of 2003, he moved across to Hank Haney. The Hank Haney period started in 2004 and lasted all the way until 2010. And no doubt, Tiger's body changed massively. I mean, he went from looking like a strong golfer to almost maybe an American football player, but very, very heavily muscled. Um, and maybe during that period, which was definitely where the injuries um, started to appear, that was a strategic mistake. But however, with Hank Haney, I never was that convinced with the driver, but certainly with the irons, it just looked fantastic. You know, Tiger was so shallow and so sweeping, that club staying outside of his hands, very, very stable, hardly ever hit the ground, you know, shallow divots. The iron swing combined with the putting, which was still absolutely at its peak, made Tiger virtually impossible to defeat. And in those 23 starts in the Hank Haney period in major tournaments, Tiger would win six of those tournaments, and he would have a strike rate on the PGA Tour of over 30%. Just an unbelievable run of form that would continue all the way up until 2010. You know, who can forget? 2008 US Open, Torrey Pines, the place where he was sort of very, very attached to win that US Open um, when he had real problems with his left knee. However, that would be the end of that particular period. He would have to go and have reconstructive surgery. He would not continue with Hank Haney. And so Tiger Woods went into the third chapter with Sean Foley and the last sort of real dynamic part of the golf swing that we've seen um, so far. So from 2010 to 2014, uh, Sean Foley was coaching uh, Tiger Woods. During that time period, obviously Tiger in and out of the game for different reasons, would pick up no major victories in the 13 attempts. Um, but still a one in 10 strike rate on the PGA Tour, he would get back to number one, but it definitely seemed, you know, different type of a golf swing. Certainly the shape of the body motion was very different than anything we had seen before. You know, Butch Harmon and Hank Haney sort of more loading that right side, but definitely we could see with, with Foley much more of the left knee bend, a bit more tilted with the upper body onto that left side, loading again that weak area, saw problems with the uh, Achilles, the knee still a problem, the top of the lower back. So the combination probably of just some wear and tear uh, on top of Tiger's incredibly stringent a gym routine and sort of this more stressed, kind of stacked, loaded golf swing, Tiger Woods' body broke down. The one thing that you can't have uh, when you're a professional athlete is a broken body. You know, golf is a strange game. You've got a sore finger uh, and you can't play. So it was one of those things that ended those particular three chapters. You know, Tiger Woods completely dominated. Nevertheless, Tiger Woods, with his ability to perform under pressure, changed the game. I mean, even non-golfers would tune in to television to watch him perform at the Masters or watch him perform at the US Open. Um, he was able to take the game from one place which was sort of a, an old man sport and through his athleticism and his commitment to the gym programs that he had really changed it. He sort of legitimized professional golfers as real athletes. And if you talk about all of the young players today, Jordan Spieth, Jason Day, Rory McIlroy, 
all heavily influenced by what they saw Tiger Woods doing, and he was the ultimate gladiator. You put him into a position. Every single time he held the lead bar one, going into a major, he ended up with that trophy. So Tiger Woods was the ultimate I can deliver under pressure guy. And it's gonna be very interesting to see what he does going forward. His job now has got to be keep his body in condition for maybe another six, seven years so he can really got the chance to compete consistently. So it'd be great to see him out there more. He will drive TV viewers to golf once again. And now I think he's got some fantastic rivals. Rory McIlroy, Jason Day, Dustin Johnson, Jordan Spieth, Henrik Stenson. If Tiger can get his game back and start to compete against those guys, we could be in for the ultimate viewing, the golden era of Tiger Woods.